So you may have noticed early on the agenda there were uh, two presentations from San Francisco on two aspects of the foodware ordinance that we passed recently. And Jen Jackson, uh, the manager of our toxics program, was going to talk about fluorinated compounds. She's in an, an another meeting uh, addressing that, so I get to do both. So I'm doing a combined presentation, so I'm until I can get 20 minutes. So I'm gonna, uh, and so what I want to say is that uh, the ordinance that we passed really builds on a history uh, that I've been involved with where, you know, about a dozen years ago, we passed our, our, our first polystyrene foam ban. Uh, we also did a, the, ban, the first ban on uh, plastic bags. Uh, then we came back uh, later uh, and expanded our, our bag ordinance, and then we also expanded uh, our foodware. So uh, we've already had at least two versions of foodware. So uh, this is sort of like foodware, maybe 3.0 for us. Our previous foodware one was expanding the polystyrene brand to all, uh, not just for food service, but to anybody who's uh, using it, selling it, uh, you can't sell any of that, and, not, and then beyond even foodware to all types of packaging. So, uh, so this ordinance was, we kind of went through a journey, uh, you know, Miriam I, and I have been talking about this for a long time. We actually worked with Clean Water Action when she was the head of it. And then she brought Samantha on and we created the Rethink Disposable Program, uh, which you'll probably hear about if you haven't previously. And so that was kind of history around kind of look, exploring the opportunities to move to uh, helping, looking at the options of reducing and reusing. And I had this broader vision that we were working on with a supervisor, uh, but then over time, given sort of political considerations, it got winnowed down a little bit. So you're gonna see what we actually passed. And I will, see, there we go. So just to acknowledge the obvious, uh, I just wanna touch on some drivers. What were the drivers here? And we really are seeing a, a movement, uh, you know, we're, we've seen this around the polystyrene bands and the bag bands a movement around the concern of, of the single-use products and plastic in particular, the impact on the environment. And locally, we have a very uh, a clear impact of litter, and that local impact of, of litter with being on the streets, stuff going down the storm drains, stuff uh, ending up in, in the bay. Uh, so, you know, we can see this stuff, uh, straws, uh, cups, and uh, that, that uh, was backed up by studies. Clean Water Action was involved in a Bay Area study in 2011 looking at hot spots going into the Bay. Two-thirds of that material that was going into the Bay is food and, and takeout packaging. So it's a significant impact. And straws are in the top 10 of cleanup. Uh, ocean, uh, the, you know, the California uh, coastal cleanup days over the last uh, you know, 15 years. So the, another issue is people say, well, you know, what about just being able to recycle and compost it? Even if we can capture that material and get it to people to put it in the recycling bins, we all probably know that the problem with some of these material, the plastic straws and the small stir sticks and splash sticks, which is kind of a new thing in the recent years, those things really are too small to recover. And uh, San Francisco, with our, our partner Ecology, uh, we've upgraded the MRF. We really have a pretty state-of-the-art MRF with optical sorters. You still cannot pick up those things. So I think that was a part of the important message because it's easy for people to think, well, you know, if you can recycle it, fine. We all know that litter is sort of separate from recycling. It just gets out there whether it's recyclable or compostable or not. But even if we recover it, we can't recycle it. So that was another driver. And then there's this other driver, which is around the toxic chemicals uh, that we find. You know, we've been learning over time more and more about toxic chemicals in plastics, uh, estrogen, uh, hormonal, uh, bisphenol A, and so forth. Well, uh, there's a whole other class of chemicals that are being used on foodware that people tend to think of as, you know, really natural and groovy, uh, the compostable fiber foodware. And so, and there, and this, I'll get into that more in detail, but that was a, another driver. And we had sort of a separate team working on that, but we saw the opportunity to be able to address that in a larger legislation. So this is what we ended up passing. Uh, this was uh, the, working with a supervisor and working through stakeholders, environmental groups like Surfrider, that have been doing a lot of campaigning around straws. 
uh, other groups uh, like Mean Water and Upstream, and a variety of, of uh, business stakeholders from the Restaurant Association, the Chamber. Uh, that resulted in legislation being uh, heard at the Board of Supervisors in May, and then uh, it, or actually introduced in May and heard heard in July. This was then eventually this was passed at the end of July. Now you'll hear that there was a follow-up. Uh, dialogue and amendment, and so we had another, we had an amended version that was passed uh, at the end of October. So basically there are kind of five things in here, and most of the, almost 90%, 90, 90 maybe 99% of the attention that we got in the media, <laughs> my, my colleague Peter is nodding his head, was all about the, the plastic straw ban, and we wanted to kind of say, but there's more to that. But there's a certain advantage in a way, you know, it's like, yeah, it's all about the straw ban, and then we're doing stuff over here that's actually more significant. I Sounds say. like Trump. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, you know, we basically said, yeah, you know, we don't really, uh, we don't need plastic straws. There are other alternatives. Uh, there's gonna, an asterisk to that I'll get back to, but by and large, we don't need the, the plastic straws or the Jack, stir sticks. Okay, use the mic, Jack. Thank you. We don't need the plastic straws and the uh, stir sticks, <laughs> cocktail sticks. So uh, that's the, what was the first thing. Uh, and then, uh, so that's about, that's the ban, you know, as Peter was outlining very well, the different options. So we had the ban there. Then we had on request. So that's really about reducing. Uh, and then we had the issue, uh, a certification issue to address the toxics and also to address the issue that we uh, had been allowing some of the poly-coated products in composting, so we want everything fully compostable. Uh, and then we had this sort of separate thing around how do we encourage a reuse, and we looked at where there was some experience around reuse programs, and we, we decided to make an entree there with events. So we kind of said, okay, with events, let's expand some of the experience there. So we had a requirement for events, and then we just sort of wanted to have the option of doing recycled content, which we explored, but we didn't set in this ordinance. So I'm just gonna elaborate on those five things and give you a little bit of background. So uh, here's sort of a graphic that we kind of used, saying, you know, no plastic straws, stirs, plugs, toothpicks. Uh, one of the questions that we dealt with is that a lot of places where they, they've banned plastic straws, they ended up saying, well, no, but you can have compostable plastic. So then we had faced the issue, well, should we allow compostable plastic? What are the arguments for it? And if you think about the drivers, so a key driver was litter, right, and the impact of the environment. Are compostable plastic a, a solution to that? No, uh, because they're made to compost in a hot composting, break down a hot composting environment. They're going to last for years uh, in the, in the in otherwise in the marine environment wherever they end up. So that, that doesn't work there. Uh, well, but they can be composted versus being recycled, yeah, but uh, composter, how are they going to tell if it's a pla real plastic, a, a petroleum-based, non-compostable, or compostable plastic? They can't. So if they're trying to pull out all the plastics ahead of time, they may be pulling that out. And then if it ends up in the compost, uh, yeah, it should break down. But are there better alternatives? Yes. So we uh, don't allow compostable plastic straws or any of these others. And there are basically alternatives available. Uh, and this gets both to the reusable, which we want to encourage, but also the single use. So single use, yeah, there's paper, variety of paper, long history. Paper, of course, preceded plastic straws, but a lot of concern is that they're not performance very well. Uh, and so we've seen companies like Aardvark coming out in recent years with a, a straw that lasts a lot longer and can, and can perform well. So that was, a, that was an issue. Uh, and there are, of course, wooden stir sticks, bamboo stir sticks, uh, you can use, you know, wheat, pasta, stir sticks, and so forth. Then on a reusable side, we've got metal, uh, we've got bam steel, bamboo, even uh, silicone. And there are even other ones that people are coming out with, like edible straws. So uh, now I'm going to get into that asterisk around the we don't need plastic straws. In the, in the process that we were going through, uh, and I was also also participating in Berkeley's process, and so I was sort of seeing it happen in both places. We had, we'd have people in the disability community say, uh, wait a minute, you know, we actually need plastic straws. And so then we said, okay, well, okay, there probably are certain situations with people with disability medical needs. And so then we put in specific language that said, strict compliance with the chapter uh, is not required in instances where it would interfere with accommodating any person's medical needs. 
So we thought, okay, well, we, we took care of that, right? You know, if you need to have it. And we just thought that very broad general language. And they're like, well. And, uh, you know, there was a, enough kind of a number of issues involved with the disability community. They, they, have a, they have a history of feeling like they're often not really included in helping to set policy that impacts them. And, uh, and so there are a lot of activists out there that just felt like that's not enough. We want to be at the table. We want to be at the table early. We're not early enough. And we're like, OK, sorry, we get that. We'll have you be in the bottom of the table. But it was still that they wanted more dialogue. And there was sort of a, a, a desire to get this passed so that we could give ourselves a lot of time with outreach and giving the heads up to the community because the effective date was generally a year later, July 2019. So what actually happened was that the supervisor was able to do a little legislative trick by saying, I'm making a copy of this and it's going to stay in committee and then the, and we're going to pass this out of the board and then we'll come back and we can amend this without having the whole clock start over. Uh, so that's essentially what was done, uh, more or less. I won't get into any more nuance on that legislative process. So once we passed the, the, the ordinance, the, the first one, the end of July, we then went back to the disability community. We have an office, a mayor's office of disability. I don't know how many local governments have that. Uh, but we actually worked with them in helping to identify and bring together a variety of, of stakeholders from the disability community. And we had these meetings around a really large conference table, about a dozen to 20 people. Uh, more like 20, I think, and we ended up having a series of meetings, and this was a lot more of a, an extensive deep dive dialogue than I thought, because, you know, I thought, well, you know, what about all these different straws, and people, a variety of people there had different experiences. Somebody had, you know, they talked about metal, doesn't work, it gets too cold or too hot, you know, it's, it, we need something that's flexible, okay, well, you know, what about silicone? Well, that doesn't work either. Some people might be allergic to it. And paper for sure doesn't work. And people talked about their experiences. We had to kind of go through. I really needed to hear like everyone uh, didn't work because I was really hoping. And there was actually an article that we kind of used where somebody in the disability community had done an analysis of all the straws and said silicone's great. But you know, uh, there's a, variety, a wide variety of people and needs uh, out there. And so eventually, for them, they were coming from the point of view of ADA. And ADA basically has a, a fairly simple concept, which is equal access to services. So if there's a public uh, business, business that's serving the public, and you have somebody who has disability needs, they ought to have afford equal access. So we all know what that means in terms of having, you know, maybe ramp access if you're on a wheelchair, or having the restroom, you know, be big enough to accommodate a wheelchair. You know, those are requirements for food establishments. But this is a part of ADA that really had not been addressed, as far as we could tell, anywhere. Uh, because as Peter was saying earlier, you know, there's not a law out there that says all restaurants or food establishments have to have a plastic straw, have to give it out. Uh, but that's kind of where they were coming from. And that was tough, because we felt like that would be going in the opposite direction of where we want to go. So where's that kind of medium? And eventually, you know, we, we were able to get agreement that uh, you know, we can talk about the, you know, the ADA need, the need for equal access. If you're going to offer a straw, then you need to have a straw that's going to work for people of disability or medical needs. So that means, you know, in their mind, for many of them, a, a plastic straw. But what if you're just a, a straw-free establishment? We weren't willing to go to say every establishment has to carry straws that weren't before. They're not totally happy with that, but they were kind of willing to live with that. And that's one of these, you know, uh, tricky tricky balances so we've actually have a whole detailed guidance written up there's some language in there that the mayor's office put together a disability that talks about ADA and the legal implications and even checking with their lawyer we do not want to use that to scare businesses in our outreach but we do need to say you have to be if if you're offering a straw there has to be uh, those who need plastic and one of the one of the tricky nuances is that a lot of these people the, the activists were saying, we, we don't really, we don't like to have to get up there and, and claim that we're dis disabled or, or prove that we're disabled, that we should be able to ask for what we need w without that. We don't want to be medicalized. And that was tricky because then it was kind of like saying anybody should be able to ask for this and get a plastic straw, even if it's not apparent that they have that need or without showing that. And that ended up, we were on the, um, on the request only, we were allowing self-service stations, 
But if you then have a business offering a paper straw through self-service, this would say you'd have to offer a plastic straw. Well, you have a plastic straw in self-service, you basically effectively have no ban or restriction on it. I mean, maybe it's a little bit less than being off, given it automatically, but that was too far. So what, the only way to have that equal access is for anybody wanting a straw, having to verbally ask for it, and then those that need a plastic one can say, I need a plastic one. So that's kind of how we ended up. Also, the original ordinance had a ban on the sale of all these items. And that ended up, we ended up exploring, well, you know, you need to be able to Food establishment needs to be able to buy the plastic straws. People of need need to be able to buy it. Well, maybe that can be in the health section. The way they ended up shaking out is we just backed off on the ban on sale of plastic straws. The rest of those plastic items, you can't sell them, but plastic straws you can. I think I've milked that one enough for now. Um, so, these, yeah, so we have basically, it's a little bit complicated. We're saying no plastic for some of these small items that we can't recover, but not for everything. And that was kind of a debate. We kind of felt like we can justify saying we can't recycle it. Uh, you could argue, why not just ban plastic for all of these? Well, there's not really a good lid that's not plastic. Uh, you can go compostable plastic there, but that's, again, we just talked about the, the limitations of that. Utensils, yeah, if you go no plastic, again, you don't want to go compostable plastic. Then you're, then you're left with just wooden uh, bamboo cutlery. Uh, there's, a, there's an argument for that, but we didn't go that far because we can recover uh, utensils, actually, and recycle them through the upgraded opticals that we have. So basically, all of these, except we call them foodware accessories, are on request. What about the actual cup? Well, if someone's coming to buy a, a drink and you say, do you want a cup with your drink? Well, no, put it in my hands. If I'm not giving you a, my own cup, it's obvious. So you don't have to ask if you want a cup. But everything else associated with that, all those accessories, yes. And that's true with the container as well. Uh, so this is just to say that on request includes self-service. I think that generally makes sense. There's ways of doing self-service that where you can use dispensers and so forth. Uh, but, you know, if you had every business actually verbally going through the, do you want this, you probably would have less use, but it would be much more cumbersome. And as, you, as we said, we're requiring it now for straws, but not for the rest of it. All right, so now I'm gonna switch to this toxic uh, fluorinated. Uh, so fluorinated chemicals um, basically have a history of being developed and being used uh, going back uh, decades in like frying pans and so forth, the Teflon. So this basically is the new generation of Teflon chemicals. Teflon chemicals were like eight and 10 carbon fluorine chain long bonds and they're synthetically made. They're the strongest bond basically known in chemistry. They're completely persistent. They'll last virtually forever. It takes like a lightning bolt to break it. So they won't break down in nature. They won't break down in composting. And the, the history of the of fluorinated chemicals was that there was, a, over time, there was a lot of studies done. There were sort of two classes of them, PFOA and PFOS. And they basically found that these things were uh, being linked to cancer, like testicular and kidney. They were being linked to hormonal development, to fertility, to ADHD, uh, to a host of, of, of human health impacts, pretty serious ones. Enough that uh, over time they were banned. Uh, so P PFO and PFOS were banned a number of years ago. But what did industry do? And this is classic. They said, okay, well, we can't use the eight and 10 fluorine bonds. Well, no, we can make them four and six long. And actually, they're just about as effective. They're extremely persistent. And so that shouldn't be a problem, right? And then they don't, the industry that's been pumped out 80 to 100,000 chemicals over the years don't have to do much testing. They really do their own testing. And then government, they're kind of innocent I mean, it sounds, you know, innocent proven guilty, it sort of sounds good, but they basically, government has to prove uh, with its own studies uh, that there's a health problem. There's very little inspection. And so uh, we now see these products used in a wide variety, uh, on not only on, on foodware, but on a lot of clothing, because they basically, what they do is they, that bond creates an impenetrable shield, and it, it's used for water and grease and stain resistance. So. You have it on fiber foodware that as a barrier, but you also have it on your clothing. Uh, you have it on your waterproof. Uh, you have it on, on, on uh, fabrics. Uh, you have it in firefighting foam. It's a lot. There are over 5,000 of these chemicals now, and 
there are qu quite a few. So um, ba basically, the, the experience is we th we did not, there was a number of testing. Silent Spring was uh, so we find them all. They're mobile and persistent. They're being found all over the globe uh, in the water in the Arctic. Uh, a study was done by Silent Spring in 2017, looking at foodware. So this was the first time they were looking at foodware. They found that they were in a majority of paper wrappers, such as dessert breads. They were in a good portion of sandwich wrappers, in a lot of paperboard, but not in paper cups, because paper cups have that polyethylene or PLA lining. And there was a particular test that was done for total fluorine. Uh, and so uh, we, were, we were concerned that, it, uh, both on the human health side, uh, but also because all these is being used on fiber and being used in, in stuff that we accepted in composting. And there were some studies that have, were done uh, in Europe and elsewhere that found that some of the compost tested had this in there. Uh, and there's also studies done in soil that that they can move up into plants or move from like biosolids into plants. There hasn't been studies that's done on food where compost. Uh, and so we, we've got a concern on the environment and we have a concern on health. More recently, the Center for Environmental Health did a study. What they did is they looked at a, a wider variety of about 140 different foodware items, four different types, uh, a lot of the wrap, wrappers, boxes, clamshells. And it, it's basically uh, in the, particularly the fibrous, you know, like bagasse, sweet based clamshell to provide that barrier. And they, they identify ones that either had no fluorine, were low in fluorine, or had a fairly high levels. And the ones that have, where, you, where they're using it for performance based is where they're, they're high levels. Uh, and if it's, if it's low fluorine, it's possible that it's, it's coming from other sources in the environment. And it's not all of its forms uh, have a health impact if it's in a low form. So basically, there are safe products. Looks like that picture's kind of washed out. Um, and what we were able to do is we were, we've been talking with the food suppliers and manufacturers around this to find alternatives. A lot of the distributors did not know about fluorinated compounds. Never heard of it. They didn't know their products had it. They didn't know that there was a health issue. Uh, so we got them to kind of work up to their manufacturers and so forth. And we're, we're finding that uh, there was a, dis was a disconnect in terms of people understanding, but there were alternatives. Not everything had it on there. You see the highest percentage in the molded fiber. But we needed to find a way to be able to test for it and to ensure that it, there wasn't going to be in the future. We got the Biodegradable Product Institute that does certification for compostable plastics or for coated papers uh, to uh, uh, add a test. And they had to go through quite a process with their membership to agree to this. But there's a test being used for compostable certification in Europe, they're taking that test. It's for total fluorine. It's actually at 100 parts per million, so it's not a zero tolerance. They can't test that low. But that means that it's not intentionally added. It's really background. And we're much less concerned with that low level than having many hundreds or thousands of parts per million. So uh, we're now, we've gotten Biodegradable Product Institute to agree to do it. Starting, their, uh, starting this in 2019, you have to test for that. They're asking all their products, they have over 8,000 they certified, to, re to test for fluorine and to submit those tests by March 31st. And so eventually, by the, by the end of 2019, all their products will be uh, certified for being fluorine free. And that 2020 date is why we set that date, just to coincide with BPI certification process. Uh, I'm just going to qu quickly wrap up. So, Another benefit of BPI certification, besides the fluorine, is that you ensure that the product's fully compostable. And there are not other, not other things there, like plastic-coated boxes or cups, uh, and a, a claim of compostable plastics. All of that has to be BPI certified. I mentioned the, the event space. <clears throat> That's been a litter problem for us. We have experience there working. Uh, event, there's been an, uh, some experience in the event space of using reusable cup programs, and we see the option of doing uh, reusable cup, souvenir cup uh, charges, uh, bring your own, and uh, this is a uh, deposit souvenirs. So this is a way to kind of push the reusable in an area where there's some, some experience, it's a controlled one-time setting. 
And finally, the, the recycled content is really about helping to drive the markets. There's some recycled <laughs> content out there, like paper cups. Starbucks uses 10%, but most of them don't have it. Some other plastics, most foodware doesn't have recycled content. So this is something where we're, we're going to work on by you know, setting goals and ratcheting that up over time. And, and finally, my last uh, slide is that uh, you know, it's a stakeholder process. And getting something passed obviously involves working with stakeholders in the business community. And, and our outreach does too. So we do comprehensive mailings. We, we've, we do kind of door-to-door uh, -door contact you know, as we're out there already and in person, social media, and so forth. And uh, with that, uh, that's, that's it. So uh, I just want to hand out the Center for Environmental Health Report on the top of the here. Uh, that and other resources are helpful. Thank you.